I really welcome to, to this session for the Data Site uh, Annual Community Meeting 2023, where we're going to talk about grant IBs, IGSN IBs, and the Global Access Program, uh, innovating for the future. And you can see we've got um, we've got an exciting roster of speakers. Um, again, Matt, if you could move on to the next slide. So the agenda today is we're going to have three talks. So the first talk is, is uh, about our grant IDs services pilot, um, and that will be a joint presentation by uh, Matt Bayes, Executive Director of Datasite, and Natasha Simons, who's Director of National Coordination at ARDC. Uh, we're going to have a presentation talking about the, the IGSN ID and the partnership between IGSN and Datasite. Um, and that will be given by Jens Klump, who uh, is a, a group leader exploration through cover at CSIRO and also president of the IGSNEV. And finally, um, a progress report on the Global Access Program given by uh, Mohammed Mustafa, who is one of our regional engagement specialists, very specifically for the Middle East and Asia. And whatever time remains, we'll, we'll have some discussion. So first of all, I'd like to sort of hand over to Matt Bayes to, to really sort of frame why these things are important strategically from a data site viewpoint. So, so Matt, please over to you. Great. Thanks, Rory, for the introduction. And thanks um, to all of you that are joining um, either this morning or afternoon, depending on where you're connecting from. Um, we just had a great session uh, talking about the, the data site strategy, reflecting on the year, year thus far and, and looking into the future a bit. Um, we also do have a repeat of that strategic session at 12 noon UTC. And so if you weren't able to join earlier and can join later, that is great because we're also looking for some, some input and insight from the community in that session. Um, but importantly for this session and following on from the strategic discussion, and apologies if you also did join the session earlier, there's two slides that I'm going to use that will repeat from the, the previous presentation. But we wanted to pin these uh, strategic initiatives and make sure that we, we understand how this fits into the context of the broader data site vision. And so if we look as a global community, as our collective effort and ecosystem that we have, what are we trying to do and what is our mission and vision? And so I like to think about this as a what if statement. And so what if we could transform the landscape of research and knowledge by sharing, uh, knowledge sharing, by seamlessly connecting re every research output and resource, so throughout the entire, entire scholarly research lifecycle, and making these effortlessly discoverable, citable, and reusable on a global scale. And so imagine the impact that this would have on academia, on innovation, and the progress of human knowledge and the impact on society. And so to a large degree as a community, we've made some really fundamental progress in moving this forward, and it's been really exciting. And I think we had a pivotal moment as a community. And if we think about these strategic initiatives that you're going to hear about now, these are really building on this collective effort in, in broadening our efforts and, and making sure that we're really making this a reality for the global community. So really exciting, um, really important work that's happening. It takes our collective action. This fits um, very uh, clearly within the third pillar of our strategic plan. So this is our multi-year strategic plan that was developed through a nine-month consultation with the community and runs from 2022 to 2025. Um, and within this strategic pillar, there are very uh, two uh, very key areas. The one is that we want to take intentional proactive steps as a trusted community PID service partner. And so this means that we addressing the needs across the community, across all outputs and resources that our community is looking to um, uh, may, uh, uh, register metadata for and, and make discoverable and making sure that we're building strategies to address these use cases. And um, this also involves partnership, working with other stakeholders in the community. And so we're not doing this alone as, as the data site community. We are also looking more broadly how we work with others and then identifying strategies that can help us accelerate this innovation in the PID services landscape. And so some of this involves strategies around securing uh, key funding to move forward certain technology or efforts um, but also um, efforts like the Global Access Program and launching the Global Access Fund are, are really priority strategies that help accelerate our, our efforts in this area. So really exciting work. Um, hopefully that kind of contextualizes 
um, IGSA and the Global Access Program and the Grant ID pilot. Um, and we'll now move straight into those presentations. So with that, I will jump into the Grant ID Services pilot. Um, uh, you'll hear from Natasha in a moment and Rory introduced us, so I won't go over that. Um, I wanted to briefly just contextualize where the Grant ID pilot is and, and a bit of an overview for this um, so far. So um, what we're doing with the Grant ID pilot is that we are leveraging the Grant ID schema that was developed by Crossref in consultation with the community. So Crossref did a lot of work and continues to do a lot of work in this area. Uh, we took, participated in the very early con conversations. Um, but linking back to our strategic plan and um, the consultation that we did at the end of 2021, beginning of 2022, moving into the strategic plan, identified that this was a need in the community. And so we wanted to refine our approach as the data site community, um, but also ensure that we're aligning our efforts and ensuring interoperability with our friends at Crofts, Crossref and not trying to build um or fragment the system even further and so it's really important that we're working together and looking for, particularly from a discovery layer that these things come together uh this being said obviously uh, supporting grant id metadata registration within our standard workflows is, is a key piece of this this is both through uh, the user interfaces, so data site Fabrica using the user interface to register grant IDs, as well as uh, any of the data site APIs. And so that's kind of the effort here around grant IDs. Um, this is embedded within our existing fee model. And so this allows uh, members and consortium organizations to obviously benefit from scalable tiers. Uh, many of our community have, um, you, you know, uh, volumes of grant IDs that they'll be registering is still within their tier and so not necessarily at an increased fee but really embedded in everything that they're doing with data site as a community and then finally obviously including grant IDs in the in the um uh, person identified graphs and the GraphQL API but also data site comments to ensure that streamlined discovery um of, of grant IDs and, and supporting community adoption um efforts uh, within this this is all what we're trying to do as a community. And this is, um, a, again, a bit from, from the previous presentation that we're a global community with a common interest. And this is ensuring that research outputs and resources are openly available and connected. Um, and it's across research outputs and resources um, across the community. The Grant ID pilot we launched um, a couple of months ago with the University of California. Uh, the Research Council of Norway and the Australia Research Data Commons. And you'll hear from Natasha specifically um, about the work that they've been doing. Um, within this pilot, we are using our standard workflows and systems. Um, we have a, a metadata crosswalk and, and process for registering grant IDs within our schema and that will inform future developments and enhancements in the schema, as well as um, managing um the the various service enhancements that, that may be needed around this the intention is to look to scale this up um in coordination with um other partners such as crossref um, um as we look to conclude the the pilot towards the end of this year um very briefly i wanted to show you a um diagram here that's um or a visual of what is possible once we start registering grant IDs. And so this is what we've done with DMP IDs, but um, the intention will be to extend this to grant IDs. So as an example here, we've got a DMP registered and the resource type is there. So this could be a grant ID in the, in the future. We can extend this to different resource types. We can track the different aggregate references and citations. We can track the different outputs that are linked to this grant ID. So journal articles, the data sets, the preprints, et cetera. We can track the different contributors to this, how they contributed to the different efforts within in the grant. Um, we can look at the different um, research outputs and resources linked into this. Um, it's possible to then go further and, and um, dig into some of these and so link into say this is an example where we could bring you know a particular um, article through that's been registered with you know say Crossref as an example um, we can track aggregate information about that as well and um, links to that that output uh, we can also go 
and uh, download metadata for this record. If it's um, an open access article, you would be able to link through to it. If it's a data set, obviously you can link through to that as well. So lots of powerful um, technology that already exists within DataCite and will be applied to grant IDs. Um, and we're really excited about uh, moving forwards on this. So I will now hand over to Natasha. Great, thanks very much, Matt. Uh, I assume you're going to drive the slides, is that right? Yeah, if that works for you. Um, yeah, Absolutely. If... Yeah, no, that's good. Okay, so uh, just if you just move forward there. So first of all, uh, thanks very much to Matt and Datasite. Um, ARDC is really pleased to be part of this grant IDs pilot. Uh, as you'll see in my presentation, it really fits with our use case and our community needs. So today I'm going to just talk a little bit about what we are and why that grant ID pilot matters to us uh, and how we're piloting that and the next steps. And I've, you know, for those who want to be distracted by cute pictures of wildlife uh, from Australia, I've put those there too. If you can name them all, you get some sort of gold star. But anyway, there we go. Next slide, please, Matt. So the ARDC is funded by the Australian Federal Government through a program called NCRIS, the National Collaborative Research Infrastructure, and we provide Australian researchers with competitive advantage through data. So our mission is uh, about building data infrastructure that drives excellence in the creation, analysis and retention of high quality data assets. And you can see here in this little chart that our focus, our strategic focus is on building thematic research data commons. So that's conceptually, you know, the tools and the skills and the data and the software and the PIDs and all those other things that enable researchers in a particular area to do great things with data. Uh, and our themes there are quite, quite broad. We have people focusing on our health and medical planet, focusing on environment, and Hass and Indigenous, so Hass, Humanities, Arts and Social Sciences, and Indigenous Data Commons as well. Uh, so next slide, please, Matt. So part of uh, developing these thematic research data commons and basically elevating Australian research in general is uh, that the ARDC plays a role in providing fundamental infrastructure services to the Australian research community. So you can see some of those on the screen there. And down the bottom left, I have highlighted persistent identifiers as one of our core services that we offer nationally. Uh, so next slide, please. So we are the data site consortium lead in Australia. We have over 70 member organisations. So to give you an idea, we have about 42 universities in Australia. Um, so a lot of our, we have not only university members, but we have other members in uh, government departments, in not-for-profit research agencies, et cetera. Uh, and this slide we developed to show the types of things that the DOI service can be used for. So as Matt said in his piece on strategy, you know, the data site have been increasingly expanding the scope of their service, which is very much appreciated in from data sets originally into all these other types of things that can be issued uh, with the DOI through that service. Um, and now the grant IDs pilot coming on, on board is a good opportunity as well. So the next one, please. So this is a bit wordy, uh, but our, we have like a lot of key motivations for participating in this pilot that will set the scene a little bit. So some of that's uh, just matching the expanding scope in DataSite and offering that scope to our members using the existing business model, which is really important. Um, building on our excellent long-time partnership with DataSite, I think our former precursor organisation, ANS, the Australian National Data Service, was a founding member of data sites. We've been involved for quite a long time. Um, and it's an opportunity to be able to test a new service, provide some feedback to data site who can then incorporate that as they offer the grant ID service mo moving forward. So the ARDC far, um, we're not a funder, but we co-invest, meaning we provide money to other organisations who put up a similar amount of money or in-kind investment to build a particular thing, like a, a national data asset, we call it, of some type, or a research platform, for example. And we want to track 
the uh, our investment. And so we already uh, mint DOIs using the Crossref service for that investment to be able to better track it. And we ask our partners to cite that DOI when they do their presentations or on websites or things like that. We also currently provide pearls, which is a different type of identifier that we started issuing, I don't know, back in 2011, 2012 or something, uh, precursor to DOIs being assigned to grants for our major research funders, and we run a grants discovery portal. And so moving into the DOIs uh, would bring us in line with international best practice, um, and we're really interested in that planned international grants discovery portal, leveraging the DOI metadata from Crossref and Datasite. And it's also integrated linked with the national PID strategy and roadmap in Australia that ARDC is leading. So the next slide, please. So this is the vision for our national PID strategy. And uh, I will mention that the emphasis of the PID strategy is not in saying do these things to the sector. It is actually involving the sector in a conversation about the common pain points they have in research and innovation sector and how persistent identifiers can help them. And that is a way to get everybody on board to help solve really, really common challenges in identifying, linking, citing data, tracking data uh, and related materials, just research across the board, all those different outputs that Matt mentioned. Uh, next slide, please. So we had, um, we've had, we have a national strategy task force. We've had a number of working groups. We have an open submissions portal um, where anyone can make a submission. The draft strategy is out. Anyone can read it. Um, here are some highlights relating specifically to grant IDs from our uh, grants working group that we had as part of this strategy. And that is that the Australian Research Council has set a really good example with their ORCID integration into their grants management system. And we have um, a case study in uh, a particular report that we commissioned from More Brains Cooperative, which has a lovely anecdotal piece from Professor Joe Shapter saying, he thinks he saved about three to four days per grant application because of the integration of ORCID into the ARC's grant submission system. So that's a huge saving. And uh, that's something that the ARC, uh, they recognise the value of ORCID. They want to see how they can leverage other PIDs such as DOIs. Um, and really grant IDs are, fu are fundamental underpinnings that facilitate the connections to the other research outputs that came through all of the working groups and that participation in the grant IDs pilot would be valuable. So next slide, please. So we are developing a capability maturity model that will enable funders to easily adopt uh, bits and to easily work towards integrating different types of PIDs in all of their systems to help with their particular use cases. So here's an example. If a funder wants to reduce the administrative burden for researchers, here are three distinct steps that they can take. They can integrate ORCID into their grant management system. They can query the ORCID API to pre-populate the grant submissions, and they can write successful grants to ORCID records uh, for people that they have given that grant to. And that's really important in completing that process and in trust, establishing trust that the ARC says they have that grant. So next slide, please. And here, if the goal is to make grants more discoverable for impact and connecting grants to outputs, then first step might be to create public landing pages for each grant, to get a raw identifier for the funding agency, uh, to assign DOIs to grant records is important there, and to contribute those records into grant discovery services. Um, next slide, please. Um, so the objectives of our grant ID pilot then were to test and provide data site with feedback on the types of things that they're after. So does the business model work for us? You know, what about the metadata schema? Does it fit uh, the, the different scenarios and use cases? How easy is it to use? And here we're looking at different use cases from research funders and research infrastructure I'm going to say funders in this case, I say providers, but I mentioned ARDC's co-investment model and other NCRIS facilities also have that model. Um, and to report back any challenges, roadblocks or suggestions for improvement. So last slide, please, Matt. 
Okay, so here has been our approach to work with other NCRIS facilities for research infrastructure funders in inverted commas to, to um, look at those use cases and how this fits there, and that's in progress. Um, we want to test out the ARDC grants, which are on our co-investment projects, and that's in progress. And we're doing little piece working with the Australian Research Council on the funders use case. So this is uh, some thoughts there are, uh, we haven't offered our data site DOI consortium to funders before because grants haven't been on the agenda. Now that they are, uh, do we expand the scope of the consortium to include funders? Because I should also mention that ARDC provides uh, pays for everyone who's a consortium member to issue those DOIs and be a member of the consortium. So it would add, add to our tab to do that, but also add a lot of value. And the added advantage is that in this pilot, any DOIs minted are production level uh, and would be part of the grants discovery portal that's being built. So uh, that's my piece. Thank you very much. Uh, there's a last slide there if you want to contact me about any of the above. So thank you, Matt. Thank you so much, Matt and Natasha. Um, so we'll move fairly swiftly on because we are a tiny bit behind schedule. So our next uh, presentation is from Jens Klump and I've already introduced Jens, so I'll just le let you go ahead. Please start, Jens. Yeah, great. Thanks to Rory for the opportunity to speak to everybody here on this um, video conference. I want to give you a quick intro to the IGSN and I'll give you the summary at the start. What is it? It's a persistent identifier for tracking samples across institutional and system boundaries and link them with data and literature. It's globally unique. It's compatible with other PID systems, and it's already been used. It's been around for a couple of years, and I'll, I'll talk about that later when I talk about this uh, partnership with DataSite. Um, and it's being used by major organizations and it's now available through DataSite to all data site members. But why? So the original use case was unique identification. On the left-hand side, you see an example of a piece of basalt that was recovered from the Pacific Ocean that in the literature is known by about a dozen different names. So when you find it in the literature, you don't actually know what you're looking at. And on the right-hand side is a map of all samples called M1 in the EarthCam database. So it, it tells you that M1 is not a good choice for a sample label. And again, it makes it impossible to track things in literature and data, but not only there. Um, this has been fixed through the IGSN system, but because we're running a bit short of time, I won't go into the details here, but what is really important and when you talk to um, your stakeholders at home and your home institutions like your collections, they will tell you why do we need another number because we already have existing identification systems, which is true and they, those collections have been doing this for a long time, but those identifiers are not globally unique. But for using them as IGSNs, you don't have to reinvent the wheel. You can actually reuse them and make your global, your local ID into a globally unique and actionable ID um, through some technical things, but um, it's, it's actually fairly easy. And in doing so, you can then link those actionable globally unique IDs to the scholarly knowledge graph. And other organizations have done that. Geoscience of Australia assigned IGSN IDs to its more than 5.5 million samples in their, exist, in their collection using the existing numbers um, as the suffix number to the uh, DOI. So it's uh, um, it actually doesn't disrupt the existing system. But it's not just a label. It's not just an, a new sticker on the box. The IGSN is an anchor of the scholarly knowledge graph in reality, into the reality. So um, this slide gives you an illustration where on the left-hand side, we have a sample from our collection, um, a piece of kaolinite that where 
its optical reflectance spectrum was measured um, and this data set is then published through the CSIRO data access portal. And this um, spectrum is then used in the uh, publication that looks at um, a, a, a mineral deposit. And all those three um, artifacts, the sample itself, the derived spectrum and the interpretation, interpretation of this spectrum in the literature are all three identified by DOI and linked with each other, so um, forming parts of the knowledge graph. In a research context, it's also important to uh, see that samples might move between organizations. It's not uncommon for our use case here in Perth that we get samples collected by the Geological Survey of Western Australia going into the lab of the Curtin University across the road, and then going on to CSRO for further analysis or parts of the sample going to a commercial lab for routine analyses. And having this um, unique identifier helps us tr trace and track those samples across institutional boundaries. And on tracking, it also means there are no more mystery samples in the mail. That you, it's very easy by using your phone and resolving the QR code that you can generate from this ID to find out what the sample is that you found lying somewhere on a bench somebody had forgotten in the lab. We also use it in our field campaigns together with um, a field data collection software called FAMES, and it allowed us to increase the efficiency of our sample collection campaigns by 100% by combining the use of this app plus pre-printed labels. And um, it really um, convinced everybody involved that this was a fantastic combination that made their lives much, much easier. IGSN has existed for quite a while. It started in 2004 as a concept and started as a technical infrastructure in 2008. But in 2018, we realized that we needed to review our operations and our operation model, operational model, technical model, and business model, and conducted a um, project called IGSN 2040. And one of the results from this project was that we were advised to join forces with another organization that would either be doing something similar in the, in the technical field or in the application field. And um, so we approached DataSight about entering a strategic partnership. And so we did in October 2021 um, and embarked on the new project to transition the existing handle-based um, IGSNs into data site DOIs. And this process where um, this portrait as a bit of a cartoon on the right-hand side of the slide, um, we're at the end of this process now. We've successfully transferred all of the legacy IGSNs into data site DOIs. And so we now have our eyes set on the path forward, which means that the IGSN organization is changing its nature. It's not um, operating a PID service by itself. This PID service is now operated by data site. So the IGSN organization is transitioning to becoming a platform for disciplinary user communities to formulate standards and best practices for the identification of samples using IGSN IDs. These communities of, we in, in working with different communities, we realize that each community has quite specific needs in how they describe their materials. Um, but also by using the data site services, we have a common kernel of metadata that we all use. 
And so IG, the IGSN organization sees its roles in providing a platform for communities to, to develop those common profiles that serve their community, but also then link with the data site services to allow the publication and registration of the, those persistent IGSN IDs. And so we work together, data site and the IGSN organization to provide the registration of physical samples, give guidance on best practices and technical solutions. And the it's more on the side of the IGSN organization to develop and publish guidelines on how this information will be displayed on the specific landing pages at in in our at our disciplinary um, organization members and how to populate data site metadata fields. And the data site samples community manager, Rory Edmonds, works with data site members who want to assign DOIs to physical samples. And for more information, you can go to our website, www.igsn.org. So thank you very much for your attention, your time. And remember that IGSN is more than a label on a box. Lovely. Thank you, Jens, and especially uh, thank you for, for keeping the time. Um, a reminder, everybody, that uh, we do have the, the Q&A functionality. So if you do have any questions, please um, add them using that. Um, but again, we'll we'll move swiftly on. Um, so uh, over to you, uh, Mohammed. please, uh, if you would like to, to go ahead. Yeah, thank you so um, much. Your Rory. Screen. Yeah, yeah. Thank you so much, Rory. I'm sharing my screen right now. Hello, everyone, uh, and welcome to this presentation regarding data site global access program and showing our progress so far. So my name is Mohammed Mustafa, the regional engagement specialist for the Middle East and Asia. So before we start, let's let me show the current data site community. So so far we have nine thousand uh, two thousand uh, two thousand two thousand nine hundred and fifty institutional repositories connected with us and using data site infrastructure. We have more than two hundred and eighty members also, and from fifty two countries. And overall, we issued fifty five million data site DOIs. And overall, we collaborate with fourteen hundred research organizations around the globe. So what are the challenges for the global? adoptions. So first of all, when we did an analysis for our membership, we found that the majority of our membership are mainly coming from Europe and North America. There are also lack of underlying infrastructure in many countries, plus low awareness about the value of persistent uh, identifiers, infrastructure, and for sure, there are some financial uh, barriers in some countries and regions. So being that in mind, in Feb 2023, data site through a fund that we received from Chan Zuckerberg Initiative, we launched our global access program to improve equity and access to our bid infrastructure in underrepresented regions through a comprehensive approach that I'm going to explain uh, later. So this is our GAP team. So we have my colleague Gabriella Mihas leading the team. We have also within the program data site hired three regional engagement specialists. My colleague Busun Oblie is leading data site activities in Africa. My colleague Arturo is managing Latin America and I am responsible for the Middle East and Asia. So within uh, the Global Access Program, we have three main components. The first component is outreach. The second one is technical infrastructure. And the third one is the funding aspect of the program. So within the, the outreach activities, we are trying, first of all, to learn from our local community stakeholders, to engage more with them, to understand their needs. It's not about we are giving advice, do that or do this. It's about understanding their needs and learning from them, also building a collaboration of opportunities with them to increase the awareness of bid infrastructure. For the technical infrastructure, we are also building a partnership with the local and the international stakeholders. And within the program also, we are seeking opportunities to build a technical infrastructure for the regional communities according to their needs. Within the program also, we're offering a funding opportunity that I'm going to highlight at the end of my presentation. We are trying to give a fund for organization also because we, are, we understand that in some regions, in some countries, there are a financial barri barriers for them to build their open infrastructure. Regarding the outreach and uh, uh, awareness activities, so 
we have been working on increasing and establishing collaboration opportunities with the local communities. So far, we delivered uh, uh, regional webinars in different languages, Spanish, Arabic, English, uh, and Turkish. We are also setting up a data site ambassador program to build that network of volunteers who can spread a data site message. We are also setting up a data site consortium ment mentorship program and also providing regional case studies on how different stakeholders use data site. So this is an example from the GAP regional webinars. So we did one for Africa, uh, the Arabic one for the Middle East uh, region. We did one for the Asian community, and we did one also for the Latin American communities in, in Spanish. Also within the GAP webinars, we are trying to build the partnerships. We had a fantastic collaboration, for example, with the Open Science South Asia Network where, and the Indian Institute of Science, where we talked to the Indian community. We are organizing a, a webinar actually next week with the Scientific and Technological Research Council of Turkey and in Iz Izmir Institute of Technology to deliver a, a webinar in Turkish to the Turkish community. We are also uh, collaborating with other partners, uh, with my colleagues in ORCID. We are delivering an Arabic workshop to the community about the open research infrastructure. So we are trying to build that partnership among all GAP regions. So this is also another aspect is increasing our uh, presence at events and conferences, whether they are online or in-person events. So as you can see, this is a list of events the data site team is attending and presenting at, and they are spanned across all the GAP regions from Argentina to South Africa, Zimbabwe, Uganda, South Africa again. And then we have uh, United Arab Emirates, India, Chile, Saudi Arabia, Colombia. So as you can see, and Malaysia, we are trying to reach to different countries, different regions, and to build that collaboration opportunities. In terms of membership uh, growth, so what we have seen since the launch of the program, we onboarded three new direct members from China, India, and Saudi Arabia. And we have also 28 new consortium organization, 11 from Asia, 10 from Latin America, and seven from Africa. And as you can see in the chart on the right is illustrating also the new cons consortium organization per country. In terms of the repository growth, and this is also a very interesting graph, we have seen 12 uh, new repositories from Asia, eight from Latin America, and eight from Africa. In terms of also the DOI registration growth, so the blue uh, chart refers to the previous year total DOIs, the red one refers to the current year uh, DOIs, and we can see the total uh, number of registered DOIs in the yellow from all the gap, uh, from each region within gap. The reason, for example, that the previous year uh, DOI total is higher compared to this year because last year at data site we imported uh, more organization that had a huge backlog so they they registered that backlog uh, last year so this is the reason that you can see a spike in the total number of registered devices last year in terms of infrastructure, the second component of our comprehensive approach with our global access program, we have been working on analyzing the infrastructure, landscape, and the use cases of different platform within uh, GAP regions. So this is a, a sample of our charts. So these reports are going to be published publicly and open also for the community to they want uh, to comment about the current landscape of repositories infrastructure in the Middle East uh, and Asia and also uh, sub-Saharan Africa. And for that, we also using standardized data sources like Open Duar, Ruar, and re 3 data and BKB illustration data as well. We can see also here this chart represent the number of repositories per country uh, in Asia using these uh, resources. And the last one highlights the repositories in Latin America with a compar uh, comparison also between the different data sources. Uh, regarding the funding, which is the, th the third component of our global access uh, program, we are opening a fund to enable research organization worldwide to make the research outputs more discoverable. So within the fund, it's open for all non-profit organization in Africa, in Asia, in the Middle East, and Latin America. They can apply for the fund. Within the fund, we have three different uh, categories that we can fund outreach activities. So this is this fund is up to 10,000 euros around uh, 
is organizing uh, an event or educational uh, resources or hosting webinars to your community to raise the awareness among them about the benefits of uh, open infrastructure data site uh, DOIs. There is another uh, category, infrastructure development. So if you want to build your own institutional repository or a publishing system for your, for your institution and integrate it with data site infrastructure, this fund is up to 20,000 euros. And for the third category, we have the demonstrator one, and this is up to 50,000 euros. So here we are looking for organization that have a broader impact on a country or a region. So for example, if you want to build a national re repository, increase the awareness on, uh, awareness on a national level, you can apply for that. The call for uh, proposals has been launched since the 1st of September, and it will be closed after three days, uh, 15th of October. So if you still want to apply, this is the URL for our Global Access Fund. Please go through the, uh, the program webpage go through also the application form. If you have any inquiries, feel free to reach to us, the regional engagement specialist for the GAP regions. So we still have uh, time if you want to apply. All the project will run throughout 2024. And it's worth also to mention that we are working now for an open call to the community who is willing to contribute to a, a second round of GAF in, in 2024. So the overall approach with the Global Access Program is we want to, first of all, learn from our regional communities, engage uh, with them, understand uh, their, ne their needs, and also build a partnership with all the communities across GAP regions. So yeah, without any further ado, and I on the clock, so thank you so much. Thank you very, very much, Mohammed, and thank you to all of the, the speakers for their presentations. That was really excellent. So we have a few questions, and I'm going to sort of We've got about 10 minutes because we have a fairly hard stop at five to the hour. So I'm going to group things a little bit in the hope that that sort of makes sense for everyone. So if all, all of the presenters, if you'd like to switch your, your cameras on and, and make sure your mics are on, that would be great. Um, so I'll, I'll group them. First of all, when it comes for the ones around the IGSN ID yens, so we have um, a question from um, Mohammed Yahia and one from David Novak, um, and I think they're sort of interrelated, so you can probably uh, answer both together. Which is um, so the first one from Mohammed is uh, can IGSN IDs be used to identify artifacts in museums? And then David uh, also asks, um, could he have more information on IGSN IDs, uh, sort of use cases in archaeology? So um, I don't know which way round you want to do that, but um, those I, those are the questions we have. Uh, yeah, I'll start with um, Mohammed's question. Uh, can IGSNs be used to identify art artifacts in museums? Definitely, yes. Um, and as um, I briefly touched upon in my presentation, you can use your existing naming conventions for artifacts by using them as, them as part of the uh, data site DOI suffix. So you don't have to reinvent any any new numbers. You can set up um, easily understandable systems of how your existing um, identifiers form part of the globally unique identifier. Um, then um, the archaeology use case, this is work in progress where um, we set up a community of practice that meets once a month. And um, we've discussed a number of archaeology use cases. I'm not really qualified to speak about that because I'm a geologist. Um, so I don't know all the nuances of, of how archaeologists work. But um, we're at, the, at a stage right now where we, where this community of practice um, collects metadata elements that they would use to describe the, the, their artifacts on landing pages. And then and the next step will be mapping some of those onto the data site metadata fields so that we would cover both aspects of making artifacts discoverable um, through rich descriptions on landing pages and the standardized 
descriptions in the data site catalog. Um, Rory, you also remember yes. uh, <laughs> community so practice. I was, yes, I was going to basically say um, this is something we'd love to discuss more with you, um, David, if you do have a particular interest in this, and we'd love to have you join us as part of the community of practice. So um, maybe um, if we can get in contact with you and we can discuss it more, I think that would be great. Um, so again, with an eye on the clock, I'm going to go a little bit different order with this because I think Diana Sisu's question should be answered first, which is um, going, but some the rest of the questions really focus on the, the grant IDs at the moment. So the first one from Diana is, what does grant mean in this context? Does it mean a funded project awarded to a researcher or a group of researchers? Uh, DMP Online is working on a machine actionable grant ID field and we find funders have different meanings for grants. So I thought that might be the, the one to start with. Yeah, I can maybe start off and Natasha, you can add. I think this is also the very reason that we're doing the pilot is working with the community to understand the application of grant IDs. What I can say is that there is a distinction between, yeah, if we look at different entities, uh, projects like RAIDs and DMPs, and as an example, um, really the the um, grant is is a prize, an award, or a type of funding that is provided, but that could be to use of a facility um, or something like that. Um, so we are looking for the community to help us define that. And this is more broadly how we work at Datasite. If we look at, you know, the concept of, say, a data set per se between one domain and discipline may differ. And so we really look to the community to work with us and help shape that moving forwards. Um, I don't think we'll always agree on the specific words 100%, but I think if we have the, the broad definition and we're relying you know, a lot on kind of the work that CrossRef has done. I think kind of just maybe touching on that briefly and and um, talking about the relationship with CrossRef is that, you know, we work very closely with CrossRef. We want to create a unified index. We also want to make sure that the work that we're doing from our grant IDs is additive to the efforts that CrossRef have done. And so they've done a lot of work focusing, you know, really with funders. If we look at the data site community and the research institutions that we work with, they also provide funding. And so um, really working with that community and making sure that this is additive and, and that we're working together. So um, we don't want to do this independently. We want to re also recognize all of the effort that CrossRef has put in thus far. And so making sure that we're adding and, and um, additive to that process um, within our, obviously our existing workflows and, and models, et cetera, and, and working with the community. And then briefly on RAIDs, so, so the link between RAIDs and grant IDs, as well as DMPs, we can link these all together. It's a different view from the, the point in kind of the PID graph or the GraphQL API, and you can look at that at different points in commons. Um, projects can have multiple multiple funding, multiple grants as an example. So um, I use Make Data Count as an example. Make Data Count has been a project that has been running for um, I think seven, eight years and has had funding from a, an award from NSF, Sloan and the Wellcome Trust. And th so three different grant IDs would be associated with the project ID, the RAID for, for that record. And so we also looking to work very closely with RAID. We have 100,000 projects already in data site metadata. And so linking these all together um, is really important. And I've spoken a lot, Natasha, I'd love to hear your... <laughs> Uh, thanks, Matt. Uh, yeah, so first of all, I'll just go back a little. So a RAID is a research activity identifier, and it is used to identify research projects. And it comes out of the ARDC, but it is scaling internationally, and it's currently being put into the European Open Science Cloud, for example. Uh, and the model there is to have multiple RAID registration agencies in different countries able to issue RAIDs. Uh, so the, we do find confusion on the word grant and project. They often get conflated. So uh, the way that I like to explain it is that a grant is something you get. So a research funder, you apply for funding, you get a grant, and there's a certain amount of relatively fixed metadata to that goes with that. And the project is something you do. So after you get the grant, you go away and you do the project. And just like a shopping list, uh, you go to the shops, 
um, you don't always get the things on the list or you get other things that were not on the list. Uh, that's what happens in the course of a project and that's what RAID is capturing, that project information around which researchers are involved and things like that. So a grant ID can be put on a RAID and as Matt mentioned, there's a multiple to multiple relationship there between grants and projects. I'll just finish by saying that the ARDC has joined the International DOI Foundation and we our, um, uh, we have applied to become a registration agency through, ID, uh, through the DOI Foundation and that will put RAIDs on the same uh, DOI infrastructure as uh, the data site uh, I, uh, DOIs and that will enable an exchange to be much easier and I really have to thank Matt who's been part of the RAID advisory group for helping us to make those decisions um, and we're really lucky uh, to have that close relationship with data site. Thanks, uh, Matt. Nat Thanks, Natasha. I should um, I should mention um, that the, the the other questions came from uh, Jan Dvorak, who was talking about um, grant uh, DOIs being interlinked with RAIDs and uh, the relationship between the the data site grant DOIs and the cross rep grant DOIs. So thank you for for touching on all of those. That that made uh, things a little faster. Um, and we were pretty much out of time. There was one other question that Matt had already has already answered, um, which it was uh, from Paloma uh, asking about grant IDs. Will they be related to raw, raw identifiers of the corresponding funding body? Uh, I don't know if there's anything more you want to say, Matt, than other than yes. <laughs> Yeah, and, and, and just, uh, you yeah, know, absolutely. And I think also just on grant ideas, you know, we want to work with Crossref. I see Ed also posted uh, its executive director, Crossref, and the work that Crossref is doing and has done. They've done a lot of efforts in this. And so we want to work collaboratively as a community in partnership um, in, in addressing the use case. And so um, we're not creating silos. We want to work together. So just calling that out uh, again and reiterating that. Wonderful. Thank you so, so much, everyone. We've reached, uh, uh, as I said, our hard stop. So um, again, I really appreciate uh, everybody joining us today. And uh, thanks, thanks to the presenters. And uh, yes, join us uh, for our next uh, session, which will be starting in a few moments. I think it's one of our training sessions. So if you're from a uh, data site uh, member or consortium organization, please come and come and join us for, for our training sessions and we'll see you otherwise later for best practices and it talks about funding and so on and so forth. So yeah, um, please, please uh, sign up if you haven't already. Take care, everyone.